Hey, uh, wanted to let you know that I didn't mean to do it this morning. I just forgot. And a lot of you on Twitter let me know that you were very upset with me about an omission in my sermon today. I didn't realize that you had become so, I guess, ex expectant of hearing quotes from JoJo. Every single time I preach at Liberty, in case you are a freshman or a fresh woman. Some of you men are praying for a fresh woman. If you are new to our campus and our community here, JoJo is my eight-year-old son. JoJo is destined for great things. JoJo may or may not become the funniest comedian who has ever lived. JoJo says highly intelligent, comical, and inappropriate things, <laughs> having no idea how inappropriate those comments really are. So I thought I would start off with a JoJo quote tonight. That ha You're welcome. You're welcome. This quote has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon. There is little, maybe some, but not much spiritual value to this quote, but he's my son, he's awesome, and if you ever get to preach at campus church, you can quote your own kids. <laughs> so we were watching TV one night, I believe this was late spring or early summer, and a commercial for the fine eating establishment that I have never personally visited in my life, Hooters came on. The women in that commercial were scantily clad, wearing very little above duct tape and dental floss. <laughs> and while I'm fiddling around trying to find the remote control to turn the channel, JoJo says as deadpan and as serious without any humor in his voice at all, this exact quote, and some of you saw this on Twitter because I always tweet with the hashtag JoJo for Convo. This is what JoJo said. He was seven years old at the time, looking straight at the TV, shaking his head in confusion. Girls that work at Hooters are just desperate. No. <laughs> he did. And we've all learned in our family, when JoJo talks, he doesn't talk that much. My older son, Jacob, talks all the time. So Joseph doesn't say much, but when he does say something, it's like a nugget of pure gold platinum plated diamonds. And so when he talks, we just shut up and we just listen. And then, I, and then I start reaching for my phone because I know I'm gonna tweet something good. So he, he looks at the TV and he says more than that. He goes, girls at work at Hooters are just desperate. Desperate for love. <laughs> Jojo for Convo, all right. Turn back in your Bibles to where we were this morning during Convo. We're going back to John chapter 3. We're in a series, a four-part series that I'm preaching all during Spiritual Emphasis Week called Amazed by Grace. And I want to show you different people in the Gospels that met Jesus and were amazed by Jesus. I wanted to say more this morning during my sermon, but we ran out of time. And so I decided I would finish up the message tonight. I'll preach tomorrow night about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, a message called Red Handed. If you've ever felt embarrassed, if you've ever felt humiliated, if you struggle with insecurity, if you struggle with feelings of shame, if you feel like you're not good enough, if you feel like God doesn't love you, if you feel like you have committed sins that would disqualify you from not only being a child of God, but even being used by God, you need to be here tomorrow night. And we're going to look at one of the most embarrassing stories in the whole entire Bible, and we're going to see how Jesus 
amazed everybody there with his grace and how Jesus came to rescue a woman who was moments away from her last breath. But tonight what I want to do is go back to where we were this morning and I want to show you another aspect of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the story of Nicodemus. So let's review for a little bit. Of course, you were here in Convo this morning, but it wouldn't hurt to talk about it for about 30 seconds. We saw a guy named Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. We know he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That would be like being on the board of trustees for Liberty University. That would be like being a, in politics, that would be like being a senator or a congressman or a congresswoman. Religiously speaking, there was nobody who had a better pedigree than Nicodemus. And some of y'all can relate to that because some of y'all came from a religious background. Some of y'all came from church, like you were raised in church, you were born in church, you were in church before you were born, your parents met in church. Like some of you, you understand what it's like to grow up in a, in a religious background. I grew up like that. I grew up in a little small uh, country town in South Carolina called Fountain Inn. And everybody was related to everybody in Fountain Inn. There was a Baptist church, a Methodist church, and a Presbyterian church, and then there were a couple of Pentecostal churches, but those people were weird because they spoke in other languages, and they danced and jumped and raised their hands. I thought they were weird till I got saved and started going to a Pentecostal church. <laughs> What's up? But in, in my little town, everybody was religious. I mean, the mayor was, was a Christian, and, and the barber was a Christian, and everybody that uh, worked in any of the restaurants or the gas stations or the, the one grocery store we had, everybody was kind of a Christian. I know what it's like to kind of grow up in that world. And my story is really similar to that of Nicodemus, because when I was seven, I walked an aisle at an invitation, and I signed a decision card, and I talked to my pastor, and all the people came down and hugged me and said, welcome to the church. And they even took a vote on whether or not they would welcome me into their fellowship, which looking back on that now, that's just really weird when you're seven years old and you want to get saved and baptized and they have to take a, a vote in church. Like what happens if, you're a, if, you, if they say no? <laughs> like, no, we will not receive the six-year-old girl into our fellowship. <laughs> like that girl's got issues, more issues in a magazine for the rest of her life. I've always thought that was weird how they vote for that. But I grew up in that, in that environment. I grew up in that world. And just like Nicodemus, all the religious ritual didn't satisfy me. All the religious ritual did not give me peace. So in John's gospel, John, who was Jesus' closest friend, who spent three and a half years with Jesus, who chronicled Jesus' life in his gospel, and then went on to write three more books in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John, who was the, the sole and only disciple to stay with Jesus all the way through at the cross during the crucifixion. John, who was so close to Jesus that Jesus gave him the responsibility on the cross to take care of Jesus' mother, Mary. John tells this story about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. He came to Jesus at night so no one would see him go meet Jesus because as a member of the Sanhedrin, you were not allowed to go to a religious leader like Jesus because Jesus didn't have the pedigree. Jesus didn't have the degree hanging up on the wall. He didn't have all of the credentials that you had to have. But Nicodemus was so lifeless. He was so hopeless. He, he had not found what he was looking for in his religious system. And he got so desperate he was willing to take a chance. We talked about this morning how Nicodemus risked his own position in the Sanhedrin. He risked losing his money because members of the Sanhedrin were rich. They got paid very well. He risked his position of autonomy and authority to where people would revere him and respect him and look up to him. He was willing to put all of that on the line if there was even a, a slight chance that Jesus had something more than religion for him. He was willing to forsake everything he had worked his whole entire life to achieve as a Jewish religious professional in the hopes that there might be a one-tenth of one percent chance that Jesus had what religion couldn't give him. And so he goes to Jesus at night, and we talked this morning, he, he's respecting Jesus. He calls him a rabbi. He butters him up. He says nice things to him, and he's asking questions about the miracles that Jesus performs. But Jesus was not going to play games with Nicodemus. Jesus in the Bible, in the four Gospels, had great 
patience with lost people and notorious sinners, but he had very little patience with religious people who kept lost people away from God. Jesus could not tolerate religious professionals who claimed to know God but acted as if God did not exist and did all that they did to keep common, blue-collar, ordinary people away from the kingdom of God. So Jesus shoots directly to the heart of the issue. Jesus goes directly to the real issue itself and he says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Meaning you will not understand God until you have a new birth. You cannot have real life until you are reborn. Nicodemus, I've got good news for you. I said that this morning. Here was Jesus' good news to Nicodemus. Your religion is not good enough. It never has been, it never will be. But the good news is I offer you something religion can't offer you. Religion can give you rules, but I can give you rebirth. Religion gives you a set of do's and don'ts, but I can give you abundant life. Religion gives you guilt and shame and condemnation, but I did not come into the world to condemn the world. I came into the world so that the world could be saved. Nicodemus, your religion can't give you that. I can give you what your buddies in the Sanhedrin can't give you. I can give you what all your friends up at the Pharisee Lodge can't give you. That thing that keeps you awake at night, Nicodemus, wondering if there's more to life than the rituals and the religion and, and all those things you go through on a regular basis, I'm what you're looking for. You have to be born again. Seems like some of y'all want to clap. Some of y'all are patty caking. You can clap if you want to. I'll just pause and let you rejoice. Look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm part Pentecostal and part Baptist. Y'all can talk back to me. Y'all can say amen. Y'all can say mm-hmm. Y'all can stand up and wave a handkerchief at me. And if you come from the church I grew up next door to, you can stand up and wave a fan with a picture of Jesus on one side and Martin Luther King Jr. on the other. I got soul. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Nicodemus says, are you crazy? How can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Now, this is a very, very fair question. Of course, Jesus is talking about spiritual rebirth. And we looked this morning and we saw a few things that we can learn from Nicodemus, that you should forfeit your position to find peace. It doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter how much fame you have. If you can't lay your head on your pillow at night and know that you're one with God, that you're right with God, that you are justified, if you cannot lay your head on your pillow tonight and know that if the world came to an end, you would wake up in the presence of God, it doesn't matter if you're a prince, a prime minister, or a president, if you don't have peace, your position is powerless. And Nicodemus had a position, but he had no peace. We also learned from Nicodemus that you can bring all of your barriers to belief to Jesus. Every barrier you have, every question, every, everything that confuses you, all of your past, all of your sin, the opinions of your friends, whatever barrier you have to believing in Jesus, just bring it to Jesus. You don't have to pretend. We also learned from Nicodemus that you can come to Jesus even in your darkness. You don't have to come to Jesus all dressed up and pretty and looking perfect. You come to Jesus, like the old hymn used to say, just as I am. You bring your sin, you bring your regret, you bring the abortion, you bring the same-sex attraction, you bring the addiction to pills, you bring the secret addiction to pornography, you bring the eating disorder, the bulimia, the anorexia, you bring the memories from prom night that you swore you'd never do, but you did. Yeah, you bring all that to Jesus. And he doesn't reject you and push you away. He opens his arms and says, come to me, all you who work and labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my burden is easy and my load is light. That's how you come to Jesus, in all of your darkness, in all of your confusion, with all of your sin, with all of your regret, with all of your shame, and He will never, ever reject you if you come to Him in your darkness. He will always receive you. He will always love you. We also learn from Nicodemus that we should not settle for I don't know. 
We don't know where Nicodemus landed on Jesus. We think that he landed in faith, but we don't know that. I mean, I'm not trying to read too much in the text here, but he did defend Jesus in John chapter 7. He did help prepare Jesus' body for burial in John 19. And I believe there's a time for a secret disciple to maybe, you know, live that way for, for a greater purpose at another time. But we don't know. We don't know if Nicodemus was a believer or if he wasn't. I tend to think that he probably was, but I don't know. And I made that point today at the end of Convo. You should never, ever, ever be okay with settling for I don't know. Don't settle for I don't know. First John 5.13 says, I've written these things to those of you who believe that you might know that you have eternal life. So at the end of this passage, we see Nicodemus amazed by grace because Jesus introduces a, a historical event into the conversation that I want to unpack for all of y'all tonight. As your pastor, my job is not just to get up here, I've said this for, for nine years at Liberty, my job is not to tell you what you want to hear, my job is to tell you what you need to hear. And I want to also teach you something tonight about the power behind what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. So we're going to go to John 3. I want to read this to you. And I want to take you back to, uh, let's pick it up at verse 10. In verse 9, Nicodemus, after Jesus says you got to be born again, he says, how can this be? Stupidest thing I've ever heard, Jesus. How in the world can a grown man like me climb back into the birth canal? That is disgusting. That is awkward. That is grotesque. That's absurd. There's no way that could ever happen. And Jesus responds to him in verse 10. You're Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? In other words, your religion has not given you what you really need. He says in verse 11, I'll tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. That word believe is going to appear seven times in this passage. He says in verse 12, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. And here is where Jesus, out of left field, like completely unannounced, I mean absolutely unexpected, brings up something that happened back in the Old Testament, in, the, in one of the five books of the law, and he brings that up in the conversation with Nicodemus, which seems like a random historical event to throw into a conversation with a religious pro who is confused about who God is and what the kingdom of God means. This is what he says in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So really what Jesus is doing here is he's introducing a historical event that happened a thousand years before he meets Nicodemus. So I want to give you a couple of ideas from the, from the second part of this story. I'd like for you to write this down. Number one, you're really born again when you truly believe. That's when you're born again. You're really born again when you truly believe. Being born again is not just a, a concept that Christians believe in. All other religions have some form of a new birth or a new life or reincarnation. But what we believe is that the Spirit of God does that for us. Well, how are you reborn? I mean, that really is the question, right? I remember my very first day of uh, high school varsity football practice. I was still at a Christian school, but we were doing spring practice. And I would leave my Christian school. I was transferred to the public school, but not until the next year. So this is like April or May, late May, I believe it was. And I would leave the Christian school and I would go to Hillcrest, the big public school, to, do, to, to practice football. And I was just a freshman at the time. And I didn't think I had any shot at making the freshman team, I mean, the uh, varsity team as a freshman. And I had never run the offense that that team ran. And I went to practice the very first day and the coach was like, all right, glad all y'all are here. This is spring practice. Uh, we got one new guy, uh, Clayton King. He's gonna be coming here next year. He goes to Shannon Forest, but he's transferring to Hillcrest. And Clayton, I hear you're a pretty good ball player. I hear you like to hit pretty hard. We'll see if you got what it takes to play ball at a public school. That's what my coach said to me. And then he goes, he goes what's your position? And I said, well, on offense or defense? He goes, either one. I said, well, on defense, I'm an outside linebacker, a defensive end. On offense, I can play guard or I can play center. He goes, 
guard. Go get on guard right now. Stan's our center. So I go line up at guard and he, goes, he starts yelling plays out at us. He's like, run the 121. I had no idea what the 121 was. I'd never been to practice before. It was my very first day. I had not played the previous year. And I remember after about four or five plays of me trying to fake it and act like I knew where to go and who to block and when to pull and when to block down or when to block over, I finally just said, coach, can you please explain the offense to me? I don't know what I'm doing. And my coach said, I was just wondering how many plays you were gonna look like a complete idiot in before you admitted to all of us that you don't know what you're doing. I knew you didn't know what you were doing. Thanks for asking, and he explained it to me. That's kind of how it is with this whole concept of being born again. Yeah, we can talk about it all day, but if nobody understands how it happens, then you can't really be born again. How does it happen? How are we born again? You are not really born again until you truly believe. That is how we experience new life. You know, another way to call it is just a big do-over. That's how you start over in life. That's how God gives you a do-over you really truly believe. Look at verse 16. We've just seen the word believe three times. Now we're going to see it four more times. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes, that's it. It's not rocket science. You don't have to have seven PhDs in doctrine and Christian theology to understand what it means to believe in Jesus. I'm going to explain more of what that means in just a moment. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Now look at verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. That's the key. That's the secret. That's it. That's what we have to do. If you don't want to be condemned in your sin, you must believe in Jesus. Remember this morning I told you, the way our world looks at human existence is birth, life, and death. But that's not how God sees it. The way real human existence happens is death, birth, life. We are born dead in our sin, condemned because we are rebellious against God and His grace. But Jesus gives us the opportunity to receive Him by faith. We are reborn and then life begins. And if you have ever really truly been born again, once your life began in Jesus, it will never ever stop. It will never end. You may die in this physical body, but you will live forever in a glorified, resurrected body. I personally can't wait until that happens. I'm personally looking forward to that. So this is what Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, if you will believe in me, all the condemnation that you've been under, that heavy weight of religious rules that you've been living under, all of those rituals you've had to keep, all the laws about how to wash your hands before you eat a meal, all those rules and regulations about what you can't do on a Sabbath day, all of those man-made legalistic expectations that have been placed on you like a yoke on an ox, all of that will go away. I can take away your condemnation, but you're gonna have to do something. You're gonna have to believe in me. You're going to have to be willing to forsake your religion, forsake all your friends if that's what it takes. You're going to have to be willing to walk away from that false sense of security that really hasn't done anything for you anyway. And you're going to have to roll the dice and go all in for me. Push all your chips across the table to the middle and say, I'm all in. Whoever believes in me is not condemned. He was speaking directly to Nicodemus' heart because Nicodemus felt the condemnation of his own sin. Do you know why? Because all he had to take care of his sin were religious rules and rituals and that never cleanses anybody. That never ever sets you free. So the key here is to believe. He says it one more time. Verse 19. Actually, verse 18, I didn't even read the whole thing. It says in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Hey guys, he loves Nicodemus. Jesus sees a genuine man who really wants to know God, 
So Jesus isn't going to play games with him. Jesus is going to lovingly and graciously tell him exactly what has to happen for him to be set free. And Jesus is using imagery here. He's talking about light and darkness. And he says in verse 20, Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus in the darkness, afraid that he would be exposed as a traitor. He came to Jesus at night so his friends would not see him visit this new controversial rabbi. And Jesus is speaking directly to Nicodemus' situation. And he's basically saying, sinful people sin in the darkness because they don't want the light to expose their evil deeds. Nicodemus, I'll receive you when you come to me in darkness darkness, but I will not let you stay in darkness. See, here's what y'all need to understand. Jesus loves you just like you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay just like you are. He loves you. He loves you in your darkness, but no, no, no. He does not love your darkness. Jesus loves me in my sin, but he doesn't love my sin. Jesus loves me in spite of my sin, but he does not condone me staying in my sin. Jesus welcomed Nicodemus into his home in the darkness, but he would not really be a loving God if he allowed Nicodemus to walk right back out into that same darkness. And that's why as a Christian, as a pastor, I have to always preach repentance for salvation. I have to always be willing to preach against sin and for grace. My goal is to let you know and to help you understand that Jesus does love you. As a matter of fact, today after Convo, this is maybe the greatest compliment anybody paid me all day. A girl came up to me, I was walking to teach one of the classes and for our, for our new campus church team that's helping run campus church now. And as I was walking over, a young lady approached me and she said, I want to tell you something. You said something last year in campus church that changed my life and God used it to save me. You told us that even if we were struggling with homosexual affections and same-sex attraction, God still loved us. And she said, I was so afraid that God hated me because I felt like I was gay. I was so afraid that I was already condemned and there was no hope for me. And this is what she told me today. When you told us that God loved gay people, she said, you telling me that helped me repent and come to Christ. And now I am ministering to other people who are struggling with it to help them see the grace of God. If Jesus really loves us, he loves us too much to let us kill ourselves in sin. I love my kids, but I don't let my kids eat a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts every morning for breakfast. They would if I'd let them, but I love them too much to do that. Jesus loves us too much to let us kill ourselves with our sin. He welcomes us with our sin, but then he wants us to turn from our sin and repent and find our true joy and our true pleasure and our true peace in him. So I want to show you one more thing here. Jesus wants Nicodemus to understand that darkness is something that is run out of town by the light. So we're really born again when we truly believe. When we believe that Jesus is the light, when we truly put our faith and trust in him. But I want to show you something else. Life begins when you look to Jesus. So it's not just looking at Jesus. It's looking to Jesus. You want to write this in your notes. You can look at Jesus. You can observe Jesus. You can read about him in the Bible. You can go to vacation Bible school. You can watch videos about Jesus. You can get all the Veggie Tales episodes that ever came out. Okay? You can look at Jesus. Just like you can stare at a portrait on a wall, just like you can look at a sunset, just like you can look at a mountain, just like you can look at the Grand Canyon, just like you can be in awe of a beautiful person, just like you can look at that girl that walks around campus all the time and think, I wonder if she'd ever go out with me. I wonder if she would like me. I wonder if she's my type. Shut up and ask the girl out eventually. Stop wondering and start asking. Okay, I'm done. I just, sometimes I just gotta, I'm done. In Jesus' name, I'm done. No more until the next time I do it. You can look at Jesus and observe him as an outsider or look, look, you can look to Jesus. When you're looking at Jesus, you see him as a source of inspiration. Kind of like a, a, you know, one of those daily, uh, our daily bread books 
that have a little devotional thought, you can look to Jesus and it's completely different than looking at Jesus. That's what Jesus is talking about here when he introduces the snake. Some of you are like, the snake? Yeah. In verse 14, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So real life begins when you look to Jesus. Some of y'all need to stop looking at him and you need to look to him. Don't look at him for inspiration, look to him for salvation. But there is a, there is a historical precedent that Jesus is referring to here. I wanna explain this to you because I think it'll help you understand exactly what he's talking about. I wanna give you a couple of verses to look at. Number three, his curse is our cure. His curse is our cure. When Jesus mentions the bronze serpent that Moses lifted up in the Old Testament, there is a deep theology there he's talking about, and he's talking about it to one of the most theologically minded men alive on earth. He is going deep into the doctrine of God and the history of the nation of Israel with Nicodemus, because what Jesus is basically saying to Nicodemus is, don't get biblical on me. I know the Bible. I wrote the Bible. I can outquote you on the Bible. So let me tell you, Nicodemus, if you want to understand what it means to be born again, if you want to understand what it means to be saved, if you want to understand what it means to believe, you're going to have to look to the Son of God, just like the Israelites had to look to the bronze serpent that Moses made in the desert. Well, we should probably go back for just a minute and understand the history behind this. A couple of verses, Genesis chapter 3. Verses 14 and 15. You may want to look there. I want to read them to you. There'll be a phrase up on the, up on the screens. The snake is cursed in Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is when God curses the serpent. The snake is cursed in Genesis 3, 14 through 15. Now turn over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. So the devil in the form of a serpent is cursed in Genesis chapter 3. God says, you will be cursed, you will crawl on the ground, on your belly, you'll eat the dust, you'll be cursed among, above all other livestock. Then Deuteronomy says, if anyone dies on a tree, you cannot leave them on the tree. Anyone who is hung on a tree, that's a, that's a very horrible way to die. They will, they will desecrate the land, don't leave them hanging on that tree because anyone who dies on a tree is under a curse. Well, you can probably see where some of this is going. Now turn to Numbers chapter 21, or you can just look up on the screens. Numbers chapter 21 tells us a very odd story. This story is about Moses. Moses has all of the Israelites with him in the desert. The Israelites are known for their idolatry. They're known for worship and false gods. The Israelites are not the most faithful people in the world. I've often said this, if the Israelites were a husband, and God were the wife, or if God were the husband and the Israelites were the wife, there would have been a divorce a thousand times because they were so unfaithful to God. So in Numbers chapter 21, the Bible says that the people of Israel had rebelled against God and God sent venomous snakes among them to bite them. People began to die. These venomous serpents began to bite the, the children of Israel. The poison went into their veins. These people began to die, and those who had been bitten but who had not yet died, God spoke to Moses and said, look at it, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Some of you have seen that ancient symbol on stationery or maybe even on a website or maybe even at a drugstore or a pharmacy 
back in your hometown of a snake on a pole. That is symbolic of all modern medicine. Because the snake, even though the venom would kill you, small doses of that venom would create an anti-venom or a cure for a snake bite. That story can be traced all the way back, excuse me, that symbol, the, the, the rod with the snake on it, is traced all the way back to Numbers chapter 21, verse 8, where God said to Moses, put a bronze serpent on a pole, lift it up, and anybody who looks at it will be saved. Anybody who looks at it will live. There is no spiritual significance to looking in a certain direction. It's simply being obedient to what God says is the way to salvation. The serpent is already cursed. He was cursed in Genesis 3. Anyone who hangs on a tree is already cursed. Deuteronomy tells us that. So now you've got a double curse in this passage. You've got the cursed serpent hanging on a tree, which is also a symbol of the curse. But now you get back to John chapter 3, and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And he goes Old Testament on him. Nicodemus understood this story. Nicodemus had read the story before. Nicodemus understood what it meant for a snake to be up on a stick, for a snake to be on a tree, for a snake to be on a pole. He understood that. So Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you know the story that you learned as a little child in synagogue, as a Jewish boy learning the Torah? You know that story about the Israelites who rebelled against God and they were bitten by a poisonous snake? You're like those Israelites. You are in rebellion. And I know that you want to know God, but there's a poison in you. And that poison is sin. And you think that religion is the cure, but religion is not the cure for your curse. Jesus understood that the only way for Nicodemus to be saved was to do the exact same thing that the Israelites did. And what does he say in John chapter 3, verse 14? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Well, when we think about that, we think about lifting up his name in worship, right? We think about lifting up his name in praise. We think about singing together in campus church or in convo. We think about lifting up his name with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And that's true, but that wasn't what Jesus was referring to about being lifted up. In John 12, 32, you might want to read that at some point. You might want to look at it right now. You definitely don't want to miss it. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, same gospel, same man telling the story. Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He wasn't talking about worship corporately. He was talking about crucifixion. Because when the Romans crucified a criminal, they laid the cross down flat on the ground. They made the criminal lay down on his back. One Roman soldier would get on one side, wrap that criminal's arm around that, that uh, crossbar with a rope, take a railroad spike and drive it right there into his, into his wrist. Another Roman soldier on the other side would do the same thing. They'd wrap that rope around his arm. They would take that railroad spike. They would drive it down into his wrist, and they would go down to his feet. They would wrap a rope around his ankles to hold his legs still. They would take that long railroad spike. They would drive it down in that joint of his ankles. And then once that criminal, once that man on death row was firmly fastened and nailed to a tree under a curse, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree once that man, Jesus Christ, was nailed to that tree, those Roman soldiers picked up that cross. They lifted the Son of Man up so that the world could see their sin hanging on that cross. And the craziest thing happened when people saw the Son of Man lifted up in crucifixion they began to believe. 2,000 years later, people are still believing. This morning in this room, 200 people believed. Last week, I saw 350 people believe. Four weeks ago at my church at New Spring, 415 people came to Jesus in one Sunday, believing in Jesus, looking to Jesus, repenting of their sin, forsaking their sin, forsaking their position, just to find peace. 
It's happening all over the world. Why? Because when Jesus is lifted up, his curse is our cure. He's cursed. He's under the weight of our sin on the cross. But his curse cures me of the disease of my sin. And it's also good enough to rescue Nicodemus from his religion. So what about you? Do you need to be rescued? You need to look at Jesus. You need to look to Jesus. You need to forsake your position. You need to, you need to give up everything, every fear, every doubt. Bring them to Jesus. Don't hide from them. Don't be afraid of them. Come to Jesus just like you are. But know this, that when you come to Jesus looking for peace, he'll tell you how to find it, but he'll tell you there's only one way and it's through him. And that's what he said to Nicodemus. Just like that serpent was lifted up on that pole and those dying Israelites had to trust God's word through Moses and they had to look at that snake, just that simple act of looking at that snake and God's grace amazingly cured them. The simple act of looking to Jesus for your salvation, for your peace, for your joy, for your satisfaction. The simple act of looking at him will arrest you with his beauty and you could never ever look away because when you see Jesus lifted up on that cross, you realize he's not still there anymore. Now he's lifted up, but he is high and lifted up. He is in the presence of God and the angels in heaven rejoice and they worship him around the clock forever and ever and ever. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Jesus alone is our salvation. Jesus alone is our satisfaction. Jesus can give you a brand new start. You can be born again, a brand new life right now. You were born dead. Now you need to be reborn so you can live. And there are some of you that need to do it right now. So let's do it right now. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, if there is anybody in this room that has never trusted you, never given their life to you, never repented of their sin, never turned away and forsaken the past, I pray they would come to you right now in all of their darkness and all of their confusion. And I pray, God, that they would be amazed by your grace. I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to open your hearts. I want to ask you in the quiet of this moment, in this gigantic room filled with thousands and thousands of people, are you absolutely sure that you've been born again? Because you could fly under the radar. You could just be another Nicodemus. You could be a Baptist Nicodemus or a Presbyterian Nicodemus. You could be a Young Life Nicodemus or a Centrifuge Nicodemus. You could be a passion Nicodemus. You could be a liberty Nicodemus. You could be faking it. You could be showing on the outside all of the decorations of a religious life, but on the inside, you could be empty and void. So my question to you right now, do you need to start over? Do you need to quit faking it? Do you need to stop pretending? Is it time for you to find your cure in his curse. Be born again right now. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. It's the only way. But the good news is you don't have to do it for yourself. Jesus did it for you. So with your eyes closed but your hearts open, before we sing, before the band plays our song and we worship the Lord together, I want to ask you right where you sit, will you pray and receive Christ by faith? Don't settle for I don't know. Don't go back to your dorm or your apartment right now and think I'll do it tomorrow night at Campus Church or I'll do it Friday morning in Convo. No, you can be born again now. You can begin that new life now. You can begin a relationship with Jesus now. You are not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the next breath. But I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying when someone is beautiful and as wonderful and as loving and compassionate as Jesus Christ offers to give you brand new life, what in the world could possibly possess you to say no? Give your life to him right now. Be born again. You're dead and you need a resurrection. 
And Jesus is here. And he offers you life right now. Pray this to him in your heart right where you sit. If you need to be saved, if you need to be born again, if you need the guilt and the shame of all your past sins taken away, this is your moment. Talk to him. I'll help you. I'll lead you. But you've got to pray it from your heart. You've got to mean it. You've got to repent. Just like I said this morning, Romans 10, 13 says, if you call on the Lord, he will save you. Pray this to him right where you sit if the Spirit of God is drawing you to God's love. Say it to him right now in your heart quietly, Jesus, I need you to save me. I bring you all my sin. I bring you all my shame. I bring you all my questions. I bring you all my confusion. This is the real me, Jesus. And I believe that you love me. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you can save me. I believe in you, Jesus. And I look to you for new life. Give me a brand new start. I want to be born again. I love you, Jesus. And I'm yours. Now with your eyes closed and your hearts still open, This is no exaggeration. This morning in Convo and tonight at Campus Church for Spiritual Emphasis Week, I don't remember any time in the 26 years I've been in ministry that I've sensed a more tangible presence of the Holy Spirit in a corporate gathering. There was a moment this morning in Convo that I swear you could hear a pin drop during the invitation. I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that God's in this room. I'm drawing your attention to the fact that hundreds of people today have met Jesus, and I believe dozens and maybe even more have met Jesus tonight. So don't give one thought to what other people will think about you. If you just called on Christ, if you just repented of your sin, if you just told Him that you believe in Him, I want you right now, boldly, deliberately, without fear, without hesitation. I want you to publicly declare that you believe in Him. So if you gave your life to Jesus this morning in Convo, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning in Convo, if you just now prayed to receive Christ by faith and you called on His name and you told Him that you believed in Him, then right here, right now, deliberately, boldly, immediately, I want you without any fanfare, without any hesitation, without any fear, I want you, if you gave your life to Christ this morning or if you just gave your life to Him right now, I'm going to ask you right now to stand straight up, right now without hesitation. Right now, stand straight up. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Stand up and stay standing. Right now, stand up. If you prayed to receive Christ, stand up. Stand up. Come on. Stand up. Stand up. If you prayed this morning, if you prayed tonight, come on. Stand up. Hey, if you've done it before, but you really meant it today, stand up. If you were raised in church, but you gave your life to Jesus for real tonight, stand up. Go ahead. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up and stay standing. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed to call on His name. Stay standing. I want to ask every one of you that are standing right now, I want you to do something. I want our campus church team to be prepared. All of you that are standing right now, I want to ask you to come and join me at the front right now. Come on, campus church team, leadership, come with them right now. Come on. Don't sit down. Come on. Come and stand right here. Come on. Right now, let's go. Don't hesitate. Let's go. If you prayed to receive Christ, Hey, you may even be confused. You may be thinking, well, I've done it before. I did it again today. Remember, you can bring your confusion to Jesus. Come on, all the way to the front, squeeze. You can bring your confusion to Jesus. Come on, if you're standing up right now, I want you to come down here. I wanna pray with you. We have leaders that are gonna pray with you. Come on, if you're standing up right now, let's go. 
come on. If you gave your life to Jesus today, come on. If you prayed and now you're born again, even if you don't really fully understand what it means, come on. I've been born again for 26 years. I still don't really have a clue what is going on, but I like it because Jesus is in me and I'm in Christ and I'm not going anywhere and neither is he. Look at this, squeeze, squeeze. Come on, squeeze in tight. Squeeze in tight, still coming. Come on, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed, come on. All the way down, if you pray to receive Christ today, come on. Unreal. Look at the power of our God. Glory to God, glory to God. I wanna to talk to you for just a second and then the band's gonna lead us in another song. There are still people that need to come. You know what? I just remember what Elmer Towns told me in the green room this morning. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. What else you gotta be doing on a Wednesday night in Lynchburg, Virginia? You ain't got nowhere to go. Don't look at me like I'm keeping you from something. This is Lynchburg. <laughs> when I was in the green room this morning, I, Dr. Towns always asks me before I preach, Brother, do you have a word from the Lord today? Every time, every time, without fail. I said, I sure do, Dr. Towns. What are you gonna be preaching from the good book today, brother? I said, I'm preaching the story of Nicodemus. He said, oh yes, ye must be born again. Dr. Towns said that. I was like, yep, that's the passage. He said, you know, I was preaching one time in 1912. And he told this story about a funeral he was preaching. And he preached about the passage, you must be born again. And he said, the Spirit of God impressed on my heart to have everybody in the room ask their neighbor, are you born again? Now I wanna make sure everybody's looking at me and listening to me right now. For those of you that are here at the altar, praise God, you've just given your life to Jesus, but and we're rejoicing about that, but I, I don't want this to turn into something silly. I don't want this to turn into a joke. This is absolutely so eternally imperative and important that I'm willing to give you the chance to be awkward right now. And I don't want this to turn into a silly little joke time. I want every single person at Spiritual Emphasis Week tonight to be born again. I want every one of you to know the Jesus that I know. I want you to know the Jesus that these people just met. I want you to know the Jesus that, that came face to face with Nicodemus and offered him amazing grace. And I want you to be as serious about this as you can. This is not a joke. So I wanna give you about 30 seconds. And I want you to look at your neighbors. Just look at the person to your left or to your right. And I want you to seriously ask them, are you born again? And I want you to start doing it right now. Like, right now, I want you to start asking each other. Are you born again? Many of you are. Nobody gets skipped. Nobody gets missed. I want you to ask your neighbor, ask your friend, ask your roommate, are you born again? I sure am, thank you. Somebody just asked me, yes. Yes, I am born again by the grace of God and I intend to stay born again for eternity. Now I'm gonna ask one more time. I'm gonna ask one more time, listen to me. This is a special moment, and I've, and I've been through nine years of these special moments of Spiritual Emphasis Week. I'm gonna ask you right now, with the lights on and everybody looking and everybody even standing up, is there anybody else in the Vine Center right now that in front of seven or eight or maybe 9,000 people, I, I think we had a pretty much a packed house tonight, doesn't matter, is there anybody else in here right now? You need to be born again. 
And if that's you, I want you, to, I want you to come and join the rest of us up here at the front right now. And yes, everybody's gonna see you do it. And so stinking what? Come on. Anybody else, you need to be born again. <laughs> Woo! Yes, come on, yeah! Praise God! Who else? Yes! Come on! Three more! Look! Look! Come on! Make room! Make room! Make room! Hey, leaders! Leaders, look and see. Look where they're at. Find them. Go to them. Go to them. Find them. Campus church team, find them. Go to them right now. Go to them right now. Lead them to Christ. Lead them to Christ. Anybody else? Come on. Run if you have to. Run if you have to. <laughs> Praise God. You can be born again. You can be born again right now. You can meet Jesus right now. You can know him right now. Anybody else? Come on. Uh, still coming. Still coming. Come on. Still coming. Praise God. <laughs> Jumped over the barricade. I love it. I love it. Jumped over a barricade to get to Jesus. Look at this. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? You need to be born again. Jesus is in this room. I'm losing my mind up on this stage right now. Look, I'm an evangelist. This is what I live for. It, just, it does not get any better than this. Is there anybody else? You need to be born again. Nothing special about this area right here. It's just that sometimes when you know you're not where you need to be and you see where you need to go, you got to move. You got to move from where you're at to where you know you need to be. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> Come on. Hey, he will receive you. He will forgive you. He loves you if you're straight. He loves you if you're crooked. He loves you if you're a criminal. He loves you if you're gay. He loves you if you're black. He loves you if you're white. But you will have to be born again if you're ever going to see the kingdom of God. He will receive you and he will give you a brand new life and everything will change. I mean, I got all night. I'll stay here until the last person gets born again. Come on, three more. Come on. Just wait, keep coming. There's, hey, this, I'm, I, I dare not stop what the Spirit of God's doing. I won't do it. Anybody else? Come on. If you need to be saved, if you need to be born again, there is grace in Jesus. Hey, your sin doesn't scare Jesus. Your sin doesn't scare him. Your sin doesn't intimidate Jesus. He defeated your sin. He crucified it, he killed it. He murdered death. Jesus is not afraid of your sin. He's not intimidated by your story. He loves you, he wants you to come to him right now. Praise God. We just want to play something behind me, whatever song y'all are going to do. Hey, I, I want to make sure we're not rushing it. I want to give you plenty of time. I do. Th look, this is historic. This is like the book of Acts type stuff. You realize that, right? because we're still in the book of Acts. It did not end. We're still in it. We're living out the 29th chapter of Acts right here, right now in this place. I'm going to ask again. 
Are you born again? You can't enter the king. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you are. The good news is you can be. You can be born again right now. Brand new start. A gigantic do-over. A new life. I'm gonna ask one more time. Does anybody else need to come to the front to receive Christ by faith? To say, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. Hey, I want to do something. I, I know that a lot of you have already prayed to receive Christ, but I also know a, a bunch of you have come on the second wave of the invitation. And I want to be very careful. This is something, for, especially for those of you that don't know me yet and you're just getting to know me as one of your pastors here, I am so careful and cautious about altar calls. I am so afraid that one day I'm going to stand before God and He's going to hold me accountable if I did not handle an invitation correctly and if I just confused people. So I wanna take my time right now, if that's okay with you, and I wanna make sure that you understand salvation is not raising your hand, it's not standing up, it's not walking forward, it's not even praying words. Millions of people every day in this world pray prayers to gods that don't exist. So you are not saved by any of those things, you are saved by the grace of God through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I want you to understand that. But I want to make sure that before we let you talk to our campus church team, before we let you talk to a prayer leader or a brother or sister in Christ, before we do that, I want to make sure that you understand you didn't just come down here to feel good. Because I'd care less how you feel. Feelings come and go. You can be feeling really, really good when you die and go to hell. So I don't care how you feel. That's not my intent right now. I don't want you just to come down here and feel good. I want to make sure that you have had a transaction with the grace of God. And I want to make sure that when you go to talk to your campus church team leader about this decision to give your life to Christ, that you have truly received him by faith. So this is what I want to do. And I'm doing more than just trying to cover all the bases. I want to make sure that no one falls through the cracks because Satan loves to confuse and distract people from the real gospel. So for all of you that have responded this morning in Convo or tonight, or even if you came during the second wave of the invitation, I want to pray with you one more time. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. You can put them beside you. You can put them down by your waist. You can put them up above your head. It doesn't matter. Just as a symbol of worship and surrender and submission. And I'm going to ask you to pray a, a prayer of confession out loud this time to Jesus, okay? And you're not praying this because Clayton King asked you to. This is a confession of faith from your heart where you are declaring to Jesus that he is Lord and you believe in him. And the Bible says that if you do this, you'll be saved. That if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved, Romans 10, 9 and 10. So I want you to confess this out loud with your mouth right now to Jesus. I love you, Jesus and I am yours. I repent of my sin. I turn away from it. I forsake my past and I give you my life. I give you control. I believe in you, Jesus. I look to you, Jesus, for my salvation. I am born again by the power of your spirit and I'm all yours. I love you, Jesus. Now God, I wanna pray for every one of these new believers. I wanna pray for every one of my new sisters and my new brothers that you have just rescued from the dominion of darkness. And we want to rejoice in the salvation that has visited this house today. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless your name. Hey, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going we're gonna to sing, and then I'm going to come back up with some final announcements. Let me just go ahead and let you know it is officially 9.01. You have only been at Campus Church for an hour and a half. I could do this all night long. I might do this all night long. You might... 
do it with me. I don't know. But probably not. But hey, I'm just saying. I want you guys and girls, just for a minute, I want you to, I want everybody just to remain standing before we sing this last song. And I want those of you that are here at the front who received Jesus today. First of all, can I just, I, I have tens of thousands of people that pray for me every day. And I ask them to pray for people to be saved. Can, can I just, they would be so encouraged to know, can I take a picture of you? I want to take a picture. Can y'all squeeze in? I'm not, I'm, I'm doing this to brag on Jesus. Can y'all squeeze in? Just squeeze as tight as you can. Come on, fill up that space right there. Fill up that space. Fill up that middle space. I want to show the world what Jesus did today at Liberty University. I want to show the world that the devil's a punk. I want to show the world that Jesus wins and the devil loses, plus he's stupid. Can y'all squeeze in? Can y'all like, see that big blue space right there? Can y'all fill that in too? And then I want to let y'all pray together for a minute, and, and y'all just stay standing. Don't leave yet. I don't, Justin, you know how to do this. You, yeah, come on. You're, you're, the, you're the nerd. Okay. All right. Panorama, right? Yeah, panorama. Yes. Is that where they're all in at one time in a big one? Yeah. Yep, that. You got to move it. Yeah, do that. Okay, ready? That, that thing you just said. Okay, hold up, hold up. So this time, can all of you that, that came forward during the invitation or that gave your life to Jesus this morning, can you just like raise your hand? Because there's like 10,000 people in here and I, I want them to see the people that were, yeah, do it again. Okay. Keep, keep the one you just did. Just raise your hand. Sweet. 